and Brian. All right, so um, if you wouldn't mind, just tell us your name and where you're from, and maybe just a quick what sports you would say are in your pocket of expertise, just so that we kind of have an idea if we have a question for you that's sports specific. Sometimes it's helpful just to know what your background is. You don't have to give us your resume, but you know, I would say for me, my, my um, strongest sports would be field hockey, lacrosse, basketball, and I'm also currently coaching volleyball, and I did a little one-year stint at track. So I would say those are my uh, those are my sports in my bag. Barry, would you mind starting us off? No, not at all. I'm Barry Mistel. I'm in just outside of Orlando, Florida, and my sport is all basketball for sure. All right, thanks, Brian. Yeah, um, Brian from Plymouth, Minnesota. Uh, I would say baseball is my uh, area of expertise, passion. But I've also coached uh, at a high school level for football and basketball. All right. Thank you. Jeffy? Yep. I am a lacrosse expert, but I have coached uh, hockey, basketball, lacrosse, soccer, volleyball, and uh, tennis. All right. Thank you. Heather. And Feffy, I'm sorry. Feffy is from Wilmington, Delaware. Yeah. Tell us where you're from, too. Go ahead. Thank Heather. you. Yep. Uh, Heather Stewart out in Gilroy, California, and I'd say first and foremost is basketball, um, but I also have experience with soccer and volleyball. All right, thanks. And Kip? I'm Kip. I'm from Dallas, Texas, and my primary sports, I would have to say, are gymnastics and football, but I've, I've worked and coached, at least from a mental coaching perspective, with a number of sports. All right, thank you. And Tex is having some camera issues, but we get to see him uh, hugging the, go what did you call it, go Goldie the Gopher? Is that what it is? That's that's Goldie the Gopher from the University of Minnesota where I work. All right. So go ahead, Tex. Tell us your so, background. Um, my experience would probably be in this order of ex expertise would be uh, high school wrestling, um, high school football, high school rugby, and, and then um, high school soccer. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Well, we're going to jump right in um, today. I think most of you, um, well, some of you were not on the Hangout last week. And if you didn't get a chance to watch that, I will always have the links available. So if you ever miss a week, just let me know. And I can always send you the link. Um, they're actually searchable on YouTube as well. So you can type in, like, week two PCA trainer course, and mm -hmm. you'll see them pop up if you ever wanted to, um, if you ever didn't get the link for that. But just let me know, and I'll be able to fill you in. So tonight what we're going to do is we're going to start off with week number two. And what I'm trying to do more of with this course than I have with the others is give you an opportunity to share ideas. Um, an hour is a short amount of time, but I'm going to try to get through the modeling of the principle rather quickly. And then I want to give you a chance to kind of try some things or sh throw out some ideas. Because as I said, this is a great forum to be able to do that. And sometimes we get shoved, shoved to the end and I give you five minutes to share. So. My goal for this course is to stop talking to give you at least uh, at least 20 to 25 minutes at the end to kind of toss some ideas around. Because as I said before, um, as I said in last week's Hangout, all of you are obviously in the right place for the right reason. Your hearts are in the right place. You're passionate about our cause. You have tons of amazing experience in coaching and playing from the youth level all the way up to the pro level. And the, hard, the only part, my job is actually simple. I just have to help you put it into a package of Positive Coaching Alliance, share some fantastic ideas on how you can make it just this exciting news to share with these coaches, give you some ideas on ways to engage the audience. But I don't think there's anything better than you sharing ideas with each other. And these, I know a lot of you do have public speaking experience, but from an audience perspective, it's kind of helpful, too, to think about all of the workshops or lectures or clinics or all the things that you've been to and what you've liked, what you've been able to connect to, and what have completely turned you off. Because everyone's different. And I think it's really important just to bring that out, that the audience that you're talking to, is they're all going to be different. And you're going to connect in many different ways. So anything, anytime you need to stop me, um, please do. So what we're going to do today is talk a little bit about, uh, we're just going to do the intro, the big picture intro of PCA. Next week, we're going to start getting into the principles. But um, last week, we sort of talked about a lot of intro things. Um, so I'm going to do a quick review, and then we're going to jump right in. Before I do that, does anyone have any uh, questions or concerns right off the bat before I get started? No. 
Nope. All right. Awesome. Um, and if for some reason you were not able to open up the PowerPoint or download the PowerPoint that I sent this week, please let me know. Send me another email, call me, and I'll make sure that we get that downloaded for you correctly. Just to let you know, too, somebody did ask me this week, our PowerPoint presentations are, once you become a certified trainer, our PowerPoint presentations are on a Google Drive folder called PCA Trainer Share. And on that folder, you will have access to all of the workshop PowerPoints that we do, all the videos that are embedded in these workshops. There's another folder that has pictures. So it's really great because you're able to customize the workshop. For example, if you're doing a workshop for just soccer coaches, you can use a soccer version of this exact workshop. We have a soccer version and we have a baseball version. However, there are pictures that you can pull from other things. We also have videos that you might want to put in if that's sports specific to the group that you're talking to. So we do give you a lot of flexibility in your workshops to be able to customize them. Not too far off the, off the path, but just a way that you can make it a little bit more personal to you. So before I jump into the workshop, um, Angelique and Elizabeth just joined us. Would you guys mind saying hi real quick? Just tell us your name, where you're from, and I just wanted to know your sport background, so if we have any questions for you about that sport, you can fill us in. Um, so. I'm Angelique. I am a lacrosse uh, men's and women's um, sport coach, as well as a field hockey sport coach and umpire for the Olympics. I, um, my background is in administration all the way down to playing. And I'm from Philadelphia, but live in South Jersey. All right, thank you. And Elizabeth. Hi, I'm Elizabeth. I am from Tampa, Florida. Um, my background is in lots of different sports. I was a gymnast. Um, main things are gymnastics, volleyball, um, soccer, and pole vaulting. I'm at Florida College right now, and I'm a freshman on their soccer team. So that's the main sport um, that I'm a part of. But. Yes, and we're very excited. Elizabeth, as you can tell, is our youngest person in the course, and uh, I'm really excited. Awesome. Mark from Tampa said, hey, I've got this college freshman that I think would be awesome to go through this. I'd love to use her in Tampa to talk to younger audiences, and I said, sign her up. So <laughs> we're really excited that you're here with us. You, you're going to learn a lot, too. <laughs> All right, so just as a quick review, last week we talked about the live workshops and why we have such an important job as trainers. Let me ask you guys a question, because Positive Coaching Alliance has so many resources. This company has so many staff members in place that are working on individual parts of this huge company. So one of the parts is our website. And we have two sections to our website. One of them is the general website that has information about the company. And the other one is called the PCA Development Zone. The Development Zone website is new, and it's I call it the WebMD for sports. It has so many resources right at your fingertips. It's a searchable database where you can type in any issue you're having, parent problems, kids not motivated, difficulty with referees, whatever it is, and it'll pull up resources for you to use. So we've got that. We also have online workshops where, you know, if people can't come out to a live workshop, the partner might say, you know what, I'd like to purchase 50 seats at an online workshop that my coaches can do at their own pace. So my question for you is, with everybody as busy as they are these days, with all the resources that are available online, why do you think people, a, a company or a, a sports team, would invest in a live workshop with you as their trainer versus just saying, hey, let my coaches do it online so they can sign off? What's the value in a live workshop? I'd like to have three of you just give me your first impression. My experience, this is Steffi, my experience is that having seen the deliverance of these uh, clinics in live, it's the person who's leading them that, that builds the energy in that room and a very positive energy and you can't get that, any kind of that type of atmosphere or learning when you just simply do it online. All right, thank you. So the person brings definite positive energy. Thank you, Feffy. Someone else? My, 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 my thought on that is that when we're doing a live workshop, it, it, um, it allows for so much more interactiveness, mm -hmm. you know, back and forth, and the interaction, and typically one conversation or one question will spur, spur, um, spur perhaps another, and, and there's just so much more interaction. It's much more of, a, of an interactive out, um, workshop than it would be a speech. Basically. Absolutely. Yep, thank you, Barry. So we want it in interactive. We want it more lively. Excellent. What's another reason? This is Tex from Minnesota. Yep. I would say that um, in participating in one of the last trainings, um, the message needs to be consistent. 
and I think with uh, a live audience, you're able to actually direct and guide the audience, so there's no misinterpretations of the information that you just might find online. And you're also a resource right there at that moment to answer and resolve concerns. Excellent. Very good point. So I want you to, th and there's many, many more. Thank you for those three. I want you to think about those things. We are being hired to come in and get people out of their homes to give up two hours, sometimes more, of their night to come out and hear what you have to say about positive coaching and how some of them are already positive coaches and they'll say, I already do this. I have a great rep rep reputation. My parents are great. My players are great. Other people might be on the opposite end of the spectrum where they say, I don't really want to hear what you have to say <laughs> because I'm doing pretty well and I scream and yell and I'm definitely not positive, but that's what these kids need. So we're asking them to come out of their comfort zone and come to a workshop that's live. What I want you to think about and focus on is just what we just said. The value of a live workshop is that it's personal. It's positive energy. That you can make a connection. As Tech said, it's consistent. You have a resource right in front of you and it's interactive. All of those things are what we want you to bring to the workshop. Now some of you might say, well of course that goes without saying. How many of you have ever been to something called a workshop that was anything but interactive? It was a two hour lecture. Yeah, absolutely all the time. How many of you have been to some a workshop or a clinic where they say, okay, this is going to be great, we're all going to connect, we're going to share ideas, and not once do you speak to another person in the room? It happens. So what I want you to realize is the value of Positive Coaching Alliance's live workshops are that we really call it a workshop for a reason. We don't want it to be a lecture. I don't even like to call it a presentation. I usually say I'm demonstrating how to facilitate these workshops because there's really not many other organizations that take this workshop idea and truly make it interactive and truly make it a workshop. So I just want you to start with that tone. Right off the bat when we talked about the SMAC recipe last week which were the 11 steps to consistency in our workshops, uh, we talked about all of them. You have a copy of that. I'm not going to go through it again with you. But today what we're going to talk about is starting with a bang. And another way to say that is starting smoothly. We want you to smart, start right off the bat, establish credibility, connect with the audience. We want you to definitely address the role of winning in competition because that's something that a lot of coaches have said, uh, positive, we're talking soft, you know, you guys are all about giving trophies, that's not what we're all about. So address that right away. And also, the value of positivity. And again, it seems obvious, but we have, we have so much fantastic research behind the fact that positivity gets better results. And I think right off the bat in your workshop, if you can set that tone that, yeah, positive coaching is more fun. Yes, everybody wants to say they're a positive coach, but when it comes right down to it, positivity gets results and there's research to back it up, clear research to back it up. Negativity, if you want to show me a study that says that negativity gets full results for the whole embodiment of an athlete, I'd love to see them. But even, it's so cool, if you didn't have a chance to read it, um, Sports Illustrated, did anybody get a chance to read the Sports Illustrated article that just came out last week? Jim Thompson is featured all over it and it's on our PCA website, it's right on the front page of the PCA website and it's about the end of negativity in college coaching. So there are quotes all over it, it's backed up by research all over it and it's Sports Illustrated which is really exciting. So this is something that we're very, very proud of. And is it this one, the last days of the abuse of coach? That's it, that's it. <laughs> You it's gotta read it. On my to read pile. You got bonus points, but no. Um, <laughs> Jim Thompson from PCA is quoted in there about four or five times, and it's it's really exciting for us. Good PR. Um, but again, that whole article, Kip, the basis of it is positivity gets better results. Positivity just makes people better. So it's a it's a great article. If you don't have it in your hand, you can go on our website, and it's right on the front page. There's a link to click to read right to it. I read it a couple times. It's fantastic. So. Last week when we started about the intro of the workshop, I was talking to you kind of about the beginning and how in the beginning you want to get multiple voices in the room. We talked last week about if I just put a question to the audience and I say, okay, Elizabeth, can you tell me how many years you've been coaching? Now, some people would say that's interactive, but if I ask Elizabeth a question or I ask one person, how many people are involved in that conversation? Show me with your hands. One, right, that's not interactive. So, two, you're right, Heather, sorry. <laughs> so, in a workshop, what I like to do is get people up right away and out of their seats, especially because it's 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock at night, sometimes early in the morning. Get them up right away before we even start. 
So I'm going to model for you, and we went over this last week. Um, we stopped right here. Who is the most influential coach in your life? So just to review, what I like to do at my workshops is get everybody up out of their seats. Right after the intro, I will have everyone stand up, and I'm going to put you, I'm going to ask all of you right now to stand up, and I'm going to ask you to get a, make a timeline for me, a semicircle timeline. Those of you that have been coaching for zero to five years are going to start over here on the left-hand side of the room. If you've been coaching for five to ten years, you're going to be standing next to them, and then 10 to 15 years, and then 15 to 20, and then 20 plus years. So what I'm going to do is ask you to stand up. I'm gonna, you're going to have to talk to the person next to you to find out how many years you've been coaching, introduce yourself, and then I want you to talk to them about who is the most influential coach in your life and tell them why. I'm going to give you all about three minutes to do that. Questions? Okay, go. And everybody in the audience is now up, out of their seats, interacting, talking, shaking hands, high-fiving. As soon as they get to their spot, now they're talking about this question. Who is the most influential coach in their life and why? Now, I do this right after we talk about the intro. We did text to sign in last week. I showed these two clips last week. There's one from um, Kevin Durant or the other one from Steve Young. I've already showed that, why they're seated as sort of the intro. And then the next thing I do is get them out of their seats. So it's probably about three minutes into their workshop. They're already interactive. Now, there's lots of ways to do it. I'm going to model the first part of this workshop, and then I'm going to ask you, what would you do? What are some things you would do to get people out of their seats and interacting? So what I'm going to ask you to do right now is go into audience mode. You guys are going to be my coaches, and I'm just going to model the next section of the workshop from here on. So if I call on you, just pretend you're a youth coach or whoever I'm talking to. You can be from whatever sport you want. Um, all right, so now that you've all been talking about who is the most influential coach in your life, um, I'm going to ask that you share, if we, if I get three people to share what their partner said. Sometimes with when we're coaching kids, kids are very, very quick to tell you about themselves. One of the skills that I like to teach my players early on is how to listen to each other. So I'm going to ask that one of you share the story that someone else told about the most influential coach in their life. And I would you know, get someone, and a lot of times too, for the audience, this is a great way that the audience isn't put on the spot, because the audience members, even adults, sometimes they're worse than kids, and they're very willing to share, oh, well, Barry told me a great story, or Brian told me a great story. I use names, and I have them share a story. And then it fills up Barry's tank, because Brian's remembering what he said. So that's a great way to uh, get them interacting as well. All right, so we've shared around the room. The coaches are still standing in their spot. And what I'm going to ask them to think about is, how do you want to be remembered as a coach? We talked about this last week, too. And I give everybody about 10 seconds just to think, someday when you're finished coaching and you hang up your whistle, the kids that you're coaching right now and having an impact on might be sitting right in this workshop someday. And I'm going to ask them the same question. And the answer they're going to say is, you were the most influential coach in their life. I want to hear why. What did they say about you? What legacy did you leave for them? I just want you to take a few minutes to quietly think about the answer to that question. And then what I'm going to ask you to do is, and I said this last week, but just to review, I have them go back to their seats. And what I'd like you to do is open up to the front cover of your book and write down one sentence, which is your legacy, how you'd like to be remembered as a coach. And then everyone quietly goes back to their seats. They have thought. They've moved around. They've written down how they want to be remembered. And now everybody's back and sitting quietly at their seats, and they're all set, and they have the book in their hand. Okay? So we're going to come back to that later. The legacy and how you want to be remembered, that really should drive the way that you coach. So today, what I'm going to share with you are lots of stories and lots of research about coaches all over the country, some of the most successful athletes and coaches in the country, and the model and the principles they use to become so successful. So what I'm going to ask is that you look back at this often. I, when I was first asked to do this, the person that asked me to do it told me to put it on a sticky note. And I wrote it on a sticky note, and they said, put it on your coaching clipboard. Put it on your bathroom mirror. Put it on your car, your, your um, dashboard of your car, wherever you'll see it before you go to practice and even after practice. And ask yourself, was that how I coached today? Is that who I wanted to be today? And I found sometimes when practices didn't go the way I wanted to, and I saw that sticky note on my dashboard, I thought, nope, that wasn't me. I was not the coach that wanted to share and show the kids that I cared, I really wasn't showing the kids I cared today. So it was a real good, great wake-up call. Well, let me tell you how our movement got started. Positive Coaching Alliance is a nonprofit that started out of the athletic department at Stanford University. 
So when I first heard that as a coach, I perked up because I thought there aren't many other places that have such high standards of athletics and academics. It started back in 1998, and since 1998, our movement has spread across the country. So we now have 14 chapters, the newest one being Portland, Oregon, which just opened up about two weeks ago. And our goal of PCA is a lofty goal. By 2020, we want to impact over 20 million athletes. We also are shooting for a goal of opening up 26 total chapters. So you can see from the Google map, we're pretty much spread across the United States, but we have seed funding coming in from places like New York City, Atlanta, these are the ones that are, and Philadelphia, woohoo, that are next on the horizon. But we are just growing by leaps and bounds. Now, one of the things that I like to ask coaches is how many of you have seen our commercial on the Super Bowl, during the Super Bowl last year? This was really exciting, and I'll get a couple hands to go up. And I always laugh and I say, you know, unfortunately, we don't have the funding to put it as a Super Bowl commercial, but we are growing. How in the world can a nonprofit grow as rapidly and have such a lofty goal by 2020 in five years if we don't have a huge budget to be able to advertise during the Super Bowl? How in the world could a company spread this fast? Any ideas? Why would anything spread fast? Anything it would works. spread fast. It works, very simply, it works, exactly. So one of the things that we're finding is we need finances, and how do we get it? Well, we have a lot of supporters. This is our, these are just a, a few samples of some of our national partners, and I'm sure a lot of you will recognize some of these organizations. Some of our biggest are U.S. Lacrosse, AAU, NSCAA Soccer. Um, you can see some other, USA Curling, which some of you might not be familiar with. One of our newest national partners is USA Field Hockey. Again, pretty exciting. Um, but these are our partners that have given a substantial amount of financial resources to be able to spread our message. And the neat thing about this is companies exactly like U.S. Lacrosse have now partnered with us, and they've made it a requirement that all coaches that go through Level 1 training for U.S. Lacrosse are partnered with Positive Coaching Alliance to receive a section of our workshops in their training. AAU also requires the AAU licensed coaches to go through Positive Coaching Alliance training, which is really, really exciting for us. Now, it's driven also by people. As I said, it's not Kelly telling you how to coach. I am just the messenger. I'm sharing information from over 25 years of research that's been collected, not only by sports psychologists, but also by athletes and coaches themselves and players. So this is just a small sample of our National Advisory Board. If you open it up to page 8 in your books, you'll see a slightly bigger list. Um, and on our website is a full list. This is a group we have... Phil Jackson, he is our national spokesperson. And the reason that Phil Jackson is our national spokesperson is he's the winningest coach. So why not take the winningest coach in the NBA and put him as our spokesperson? The neat thing is Phil Jackson's a pretty private man for many of you that know him. And I've been told that he doesn't like to do TV interviews. And once he was doing an interview for ESPN and he said, okay, I'll give you two minutes. And he talked about the Lakers and he talked about the team. And then as he was walking out, they said, Phil, um, I heard you're also a spokesperson for a nonprofit called the Positive Coaching Alliance. Would you mind telling us about that? And Phil went back into the interview and he sat down for 20 more minutes and talked about positive coaching, which is pretty exciting. Does anyone recognize anyone else on that National Advisory Board? Just call them out if you guys recognize anybody. I do. Doc Rivers. I'd Doc Rivers. Me. Yes, thank Brandy, you. Brandy Chastain. Brandy Chastain. Who else? can't tell who's Sorry, I that? can't see. i got to talk so you can make them loud. Can you see anybody else on there? Herm Edwards. Herm, Herm Edwards. Edwards in the corner, yeah. Yes, Herm Edwards, Shane Battier, Brenda Villa, water polo Olympian, absolutely. And this one, this is Vanessa Bernard. Most of you don't know Vanessa Bernard, but Vanessa Bernard was actually nominated for our National Youth Sports Award in 2014. Every year, we award 50 coaches in the United States for modeling the double goal coach model and being a positive coach. And we fly four of them out to California for our big National Youth Sports Awards banquet and recognize them. They're coaches just like you that have the right idea of how to be a positive coach and they're making a huge difference. So anyone that has ever said to me before, positive coaching, yeah, rah, rah, it's all soft. Um, I don't think if you ever ask any of these people if they were soft and non-competitive, I don't think you'd ever describe any of them that way. So these are people that have contributed a lot to our movement. And it's constantly, we're constantly adding resources all the time and adding National Advisory Board members, which is exciting. All right, so let's get started with this model of coaching. This is the model of coaching that we are striving for. We talked about positive coaching a lot of the time. I want you to think right now as coaches, all right? What I want you to do is I want you to turn to the person next to you, and I want you to describe for me 
the most positive coach you have ever seen. Tell me what that person is doing, acting, looking like. Turn to the person next to you, and I want you to sh not only tell them, but show them with your facial expressions. What is that coach looking like on the sidelines? Okay, go. All of you. Okay, so I would have them turn to a partner. Somebody here in this group, just share for me. Tell me about what a positive coach is like. Pretend I was your partner. You can't really turn to a partner, so I'm going to have to call on you now. I'm going to have to pick on you. Heather, tell me what a positive coach is like. A uh, positive coach is one who, uh, no matter what happens, can find the positive in anything. And so when you're struggling, they're in your corner, and they're cheering you on. And, um, you know, when, when you make mistakes, they, they teach you how to let it go and, um, and find the positive way to move on past it. Um, you know, their body language is uplifting, and it's, uh, you know, they're not hanging their head. Um, and you can look to them at any moment and know that they're invested. Great. Thank you. Heather, call on one other person to share me a little bit more about what their body language is like. Go ahead. Um, Elizabeth. Um, I have one coach right now who on the sideline just sits there and talks the whole time. And um, every time you make a mistake, instead of saying that was bad, he says better touch next time. Um, and he's just like very talkative and uses his hands and um, very personable with the way he relates to you when, he, when he's talking. All right, awesome. So I would have a couple people share, but you can feel the energy in the room just rise. You've got people that are smiling and their hands are up and they're talking about positivity. Now, coaches, we all know what a positive coach looks like. I want you to describe for me what the players look like that are being coached by that coach. Give me some adjectives and some words to describe the kids that are in that coach's care for that one practice. Let's say you were just a bystander watching that game or that practice. Tell me what those kids look like. Hard working. Hard working, very good. What else? They're receptive. Yep, definitely. Like, kind of nod, like every time they're like nodding, like okay, okay, like next one. Yep, I got it, I got it. Yep. They are supportive of each other, and you hear that verbally. Yes, verbally supportive of each other. I love it. What I else? They're smiling. Engaged. They're smiling. <laughs> I would say engaged. That's engaged. Absolutely. I have a I have a two year old puppy dog, and I walk in the door, and she's like, okay, yeah, what's next? What's next? What's next? And that's what I picture these kids because they're just so excited to be there and it's it's exciting to be part of that movement. You can feel the energy in the room. Now, what's the opposite of a positive coach? Obviously, everybody, a? Negative coach. Negative coach, right. Negative, negative, coach. Coach. negative right. coach. All right, now, this shouldn't be too hard. I want you to turn to the opposite side than you did the last time. You turn to your right, now I want you to turn to your left or whichever, and I want you to describe for me, and I all want you to get a picture in your mind. You probably have someone specific in mind. <laughs> Tell me about that negative coach. I'm only going to give you one minute this time. Describe that negative coach for me. Go. All right, Brian, tell me something. Pretend you were my partner. Tell me about the negative coach. Um, I would say a couple of things. One is they're probably raising their voice because they haven't done a very good job in practice of preparing their players. So they're trying to compensate that by yelling instruction. And two, their body language probably is sending a negative message to the player. Okay, so tell me what the body language looks like, Brian. Arms are crossed. Uh, maybe there's a frown on the face. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe they're pacing. Um, baseball, I often see coaches outside the dugout for whatever reason, standing there kind of looking over the shoulder of their players because their players are going to make a mistake. Mm hmm Absolutely. Brian, call on one other person to describe for me what a negative coach looks um, like, embodies. I'm going to call on my fellow Minnesotan with Tex. <laughs> you bet. Now, Brian, Brian took a lot of them, but uh, you know, one of the things I've noticed from negative coaches is uh, they have a tendency to start yelling at the player, and then after that they start yelling at the other coaches. And <laughs> the other coaches, uh, you know, fix the problem, fix the problem. If you can't fix it, I will fix it. And so what happens is they start having that dialogue with the other adults, and it just feeds right into the guidelines or whatever it might be. And I'll also mention that they will probably physically grab something, um, unfortunately maybe in a player or a clipboard or a hat, and they will actually physically start to destroy it, throw it, or anything like that. Yeah, anything to get out that aggression. Absolutely. Now, you know what I'm going to ask you? The players, describe for me some adjectives to describe the players that are playing for that coach. What do they look like? Their heads are hanging low. Heads are hanging low. What else? Tears. Yep. What else? 
they're paying more attention to who's listening mm -hmm. than they are to the message. Good. They're looking around, checking out their, their teammates, comparing themselves to each other. What else? I they think start bickering with each other. Say that again? Text from Minnesota. They start bickering with each other, trying to place blame. Yes. Good. Trying to place blame. That's exactly um, right. One thing I saw um, with negative coaches is there's a separation in the team that's visual and physical. Mm -hmm. So the ones who are functioning under the comfort zone of a, uh, a negative coach, they're in one place, usually closer to the coach because they are the chosen ones, and then the rest of the team is separated and disconnected or silent in other areas of the team. Good. Okay, now, the neat thing is, is when I asked you to compare, this is a continuum, because we've got coaches that are at one end of the spectrum of very, very negative, and we've got the coaches that are at the other end of the spectrum of very, very positive. 90% of the coaches fall somewhere in between, and a lot of it is situational, depending on what's going on in practice or a game that day. All of us, it described, it's very easy to describe a positive coach and what the player looks like. It's very easy to describe a negative coach and what the player looks like. And if I ask any of you right now, which would you rather have in terms of players on your field? I can say with 100% security that you would all say, oh, yeah, you're gonna say positive. the positive, absolutely 100%. And I haven't even shared with you the research behind it yet. You all know that the kids that are wagging their tail, they're excited, they can't wait to hear more, they're supporting each other verbally and physically, the ones that are listening to what you have to say and they're coachable, are they going to play better or worse than the ones that are negatively coached. How many of you would say they're going to play better? Oh, definitely. How many of you are going to say they're going to play worse? Not many of you. So these are things that up here in our mind we know, we're conscious of. But when it comes right down to it, we have to figure out how we get there on a consistent basis because bottom line is positivity creates better results and that's what we're looking for. So the model that we're striving for and the model that we talk about in positive coaching is called the double goal coach. Most of us have the first goal in mind, striving to win. That's why we're here. As I said, the National Advisory Board's competitive. I am one of the most competitive people you will ever find. Ask my family when they pay Monopoly. Just back off because I can be. I was even competitive at yoga last week. I think some of you I shared that with. I can make yoga competitive. Yes, I can. Um, <laughs> that's our goal, striving to win. However, the double goal, the more important goal, is teaching life lessons. Not only teaching just generic life lessons, but teaching the positive life lessons that you stick with, that stick with you throughout your life. Now, hold on, let me grab it. Okay. I always have a ball with me all the time, whether it's a beach ball or a soccer ball or a little blow-up ball. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to ask you all to think of the life lessons that sports has taught you into your adulthood. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to toss the ball. And when I toss it, I want you to just call out one of those life lessons that you use every day in your life. So I, this, is, this is to get them up and moving around. I'm going to ask everybody to stand up. And sometimes I use a beach ball. I just have a little soccer ball with me right now. But I'm going to toss the ball to Kip. And Kip, say one of them and then toss it to somebody else. Uh, I'd say one of the biggest life lessons is absolutely uh, perseverance. You know, when perseverance. You're yeah, when you feel like you're down and out or you are you have an off day or an off competition is that, you know, there, that whole concept of recovering from a mistake and not letting it keep you down. Good job. All right, Kit, pass it to somebody else. Call somebody else and pretend you're throwing the ball to him. Uh, I'll pass it over there to Barry. One life okay. lesson, Barry. Well, with me, there's no question. That's uh, the only difference between stumbling blocks and stepping stones is how we use it. Nice. I like it. Brett from Hawaii actually used that as a quote on his discussion questions this week. All right, Barry, toss it to somebody else. Um, gosh, I don't know. Um, anybody grab it. <laughs> Somebody grab it. I'll take, I'll take it. Okay, go ahead, Heather. Uh, Heather. Um, the ability to work together towards a common goal. All right, thank you. So uh, at this point, I will have the ball passed back and forth for a few minutes. We'll get about 10 different life lessons. They'll say determination, resilience, teamwork, how to bounce back from mistakes, how to be coachable, how to work together. So these are all the life lessons. So these are the goals. Oh, can somebody mute me? I'm getting feedback. I'm hearing feedback somehow. Just mute for a second. 
you guys don't mind. I'm hearing myself talking. Thanks. Hold on. I'll mute you there. See if that helps. Okay. So the goal, the the uh, the model that we're trying to talk about is striving to win, but teaching life lessons is more important. Like never, when I've done these workshops, has anyone ever said to me, "The life lesson." I'm still getting echo. Okay. The life lessons that have stuck with me are how to stop a soccer ball on a dime or how to shoot a perfect foul shot. These aren't. These are the sports lessons. These are the tactical skills that we, as coaches, spend so much time trying to get through the heads of these little athletes, but. The life lessons that you just talked about are the ones that stick with you every single day. So the merging of these two, the striving to win and teaching life lessons, is our goal. Where ultimately, the teaching life lessons, in double goal coaches, teaching life lessons always trumps winning. Some of you may understand that that doesn't always happen. I'm muting you again, Mary. Sorry about that. Okay. This doesn't always happen. Now, at this point in the workshop, this is trainer to trainer here. Another way that you can have it, um, have a good discussion, starter, I don't do this at every workshop, but depending on what kind of a feedback you're getting from the audience, some might still be like, yeah, I'm not really getting this whole winning versus life lessons, that I might start a line of questioning or discussion that says, you know, at some point, we can all say, yeah, definitely life lessons are more important than winning, but at some point, these two goals collide. So another channel that you might want to do is have the coaches discuss, when does winning and life lessons, when do they collide? For example... You are a coach that believes everyone should get equal playing time, which is a very simple rule. A lot of youth sports teams have it. And you're down by one goal, and there's two minutes left in the game, and you look over, and you've got three kids on the bench that haven't gotten in the game yet, and you've got your four starters out there, and you are really excited about winning this game because you're very, very close, but those three kids are looking at you like, uh, Coach, you said you'd put me in. So sometimes as coaches, we might choose winning over life lessons, where the true thing – to have integrity, you would put those kids in. So again, this might be a way that you want to get a discussion started. Um, it's a good, it's a good discussion to have. It's worked well. I don't do it at every workshop, but I'm just giving you another idea. All right. So, double goal coaching is the model for coaches. We at PCA realize that we can't do this by ourselves, just as coaches, because in the drama of youth sports, there's a lot more people involved than just the coaches. If you're coaching youth, you've got a huge part of the drama involved. Who is probably the, one of the most influential people in the young athletes lives at this moment parents. their parents yeah. exactly parents can be a wonderful asset to every team they are supportive they get their kids there on time they're in charge of making sure they're nutritionally and physically ready for you they are there to offer their assistance and their help in any way they can and support you in teaching the life lessons that sports has does anybody have parents like that on their team yeah. does anybody have all parents like that on your team <laughs> Not really. That's why the Little League Orphans uh, coach is probably one of the most coveted positions that we have. Yes, parents. We want parents to be an asset. You as coaches focus on winning and teaching life lessons. We want parents to only focus on the life lessons. We call them second goal parents. We want you to let the winning to the athletes and the coaches. Parents, we want you to be there to support the coaches any way that you can and support your children in the life lessons, meaning things might not always go their way. Your child might not get as much playing time as he or she thinks she does. So a, a parent that's a second or a double goal parent might call that coach up right away and say, hey, coach, my kid's not getting enough playing time. What's the problem? But wouldn't it be better if the, co if the parent said, hey, coach, I mean, hey, kid, sorry, to their child, we want you to find out what you can do to play more. Are you working your hardest? Are you asking the coach for help? Maybe you need to go to practice tomorrow and check in with your coach and see what you can do to get some more playing time. That is how a parent would support the coach. The same result would happen. The same result would happen and the life lessons would be learned. So those are the roles of the coaches and the parents, but we also have the leaders. The leaders in the group are the administration, the board, they're the people that support this culture. They're the people that contacted us to come out and talk to you today as coaches. They're called the single goal leaders, and it's their job to defend this culture of positive coaching. And then the last one are the athletes themselves. We now do workshops for high school, college age athletes, middle school, and even a few elementary school. And with the athletes, we focus them on being a triple impact competitor. What does it truly mean to compete? And competing and being a triple impact competitor means they are constantly obsessed with making themselves better, their teammates better, and the game better. So this is the model that
that we are really attaining to and we would like every single team in this country, we would like this to be the norm, not the exception. And if we can hit 20 million by 2020, it's starting to push that tipping point a little bit closer. All right, every workshop that we do has three principles. We stay consistent through all of our workshops. Those three principles are very simple. The first one is called the Elm Tree of Mastery. The goal of that principle is performance. How do you get the best performance out of your athletes? And this is non-controversial in sports psychology research. Most of you don't have a sports psychologist on staff, so I'm going to help you out, and I'm going to share the research with you. The second principle is filling the emotional tanks. What's the goal of that principle? The goal of that is so that we have athletes that are coachable, that will listen to us, that will be in the state of mind that they are going to be so excited to hear what you have to say because their tanks are full, they're emotionally ready, and they are coachable. And the last one's called honoring the game. This is the third principle that runs through every workshop that we do. I had an athlete one time that I said, who can tell me what honoring the game is? And he said, oh, I remember, I remember. And I said, what's honoring the game? He said, it's like sportsmanship on crack. <laughs> and I went, okay, that's one way to say it. We take sportsmanship to the nth degree. We take it in five different areas, and we talk about, this is very black and white. You need to have respect for these five areas. That's how you will become a better athlete. The game is bigger than yourself at that moment. So this is, um, these are our three principles that we're going to dive into today. And I think for right now, I'm going to stop there. All right, so that's the intro. Um, I stopped a little bit to talk to you, but that intro part from the very beginning where I started last week, right here, to the slide where I just stopped you, takes about 15 minutes. So just to give you an idea, our workshops usually run, um, it's sold for about 90 minutes, but I say the intro is about 15, each principle is about 15 minutes, which will give you an hour, and then we do a scenario menu wrap-up, which is 15 minutes at the end, and then I always leave an extra 15 minutes at the end for evaluations, questions, things like that. So that's where you get your 90-minute workshop from. All right, now, I promised 20 minutes, but we've got 15. What I'd like you guys to do right now is just to think for a second, either the intro part that I did last week, um, if you have some ideas or things that you've used, even how to use the video, possibly this question, because I have a couple ideas I can share with you, other ways that trainers have used this question, and or any of the, the MAP stuff, National Advisory Board, Double Goal Coach Model. Um, I would like to give you an opportunity, as many of you as I can. What I'm going to do is um, set my timer. I know this sounds really cheesy, but I'm going to set the timer. I'm going to give each of you about two minutes or three minutes to explain. If I go a little bit, if I don't, then people talk for seven minutes and nobody else gets a chance. So... If any of you would like to start, if you wouldn't mind, share with us. Bounce some ideas around. What do you like? What have you seen done? Um, how would you do it? And at some point in these Google Hangouts, you're all going to get a chance because I write down who shares with me tonight, and then I won't pick on you another night. So I won't have a chance to get you all in. But and if not, I'll just pick on you because, Feffy, I know you did this double goal coach part last week, so I might pick on you to share how it went. <laughs> well, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I did. I did the double goal coach in a uh, PCA part of the U.S. lacrosse clinic that we ran in Voorhees, New Jersey. We had 100 uh, men and women that were there. To 98% uh, of them were parents of uh, youth athletes. Most of them had not had any background in the sport of lacrosse. So we started the morning with teaching a skill, brought it back in, did a little intro about U.S. lacrosse and what the coaching certification program is about, and then we began the hour of PCA. And I had the slides that involved uh, the circles and how they went, and also about the big picture of uh, the development zone. Um, I used the technique of people to your right, people to your left, to discuss negative and positive coaching. And that worked very well. We shared, um, I, I picked a name out of the hat. Like, anyone who's named John, you're going to speak. Anyone who's named Sally, and then I just kept going with names until enough people stood up. Because out of 100 people, it was very difficult to, like, select who was going to speak. So I just chose names randomly. And those people reported on their discussion that they'd had with their partner. And I took uh, about four groups to talk about negative and four groups to talk about positive coaches and then I talked, asked them then to discuss with their partners uh, this time they went back to front, person in front of you, person in back of you, uh, 
how do they want to be remembered? And then again, I picked out actually five groups. And then that time I asked for who would like to share versus um, picking a name out. Um, their, how they want to be remembered as a coach. And I had actually people kept volunteering. I had to say that's enough. But it was really exciting to, to see the group share that way. So we use a concept called pair, uh, pair and share mm -hmm. in our presentations. <clears throat> and with a large group like that, it, it seems to be the most efficient. There wasn't enough room to get them up and walk around the room or anything. We literally were pulling chairs. We had 30 walk-ins. So, um, But it was a great fueled uh, group who at this time of year have to be certified in order to coach by spring. Uh, I then led a discussion on the development zone and each one I had a question prepared. You know, Who are these leaders in your case here in South Jersey um, that are going to be your uh, setting of, of policy and principle um, and the single goal leader and luckily the gentleman who's in charge of youth lacrosse in that area stood up right away and said this is what they're doing so he was informing all these people that are brand new to his chapter and his youth group what they're going to do for you like the clinic that we were doing mm -hmm. we talked then again about second goal parents and I said there's no doubt in my mind and I shared with them how I built culture with my various high school teams I shared an example of how to do that and how I meet with them before and how we use the lifesaver routine where if a parent is a captain are asked to carry lifesavers to the game and if a parent is speaking out of order then they give them a lifesaver which is an indication that someone is judging what they're saying to be inappropriate um, so we talked about how to set a positive culture with the parents in a game Talk about a little bit about the impact of the athlete and just really uh, talk to them about how they need to have that seminar brought into South Jersey for the athletes to all hear. Uh, and then we went back to Double Gold Coach and talked about this is what we're going to talk about today and it was the circles. Now in my presentation the circles were actually after that particular slide mm -hmm. so it was a great lead in sure. to those two slides. Absolutely. Thank you very much. We actually call them parent pops, and um, parent PCA, pops, okay. PCA actually sells them. They, they're these big, they're disgusting tasting, but the partner can actually purchase parent, they're like big round lollipops that say honor the game on them. Um, I bring dum-dums, pun intended, to all my games. They cost like $2.17, and I, always, I bring them to the workshops too, and I toss them out to people, and I say, you know, very effective to have in your coaching bag. Have a culture keeper parent say, you're in charge, Mrs. Jones, of giving out dum-dums if anybody seems to need one. Um, so thank you, Feffy, for sharing that. Well, I had a dentist as my first culture keeper, and I had to do uh, sugar-free. Oh. And lifesavers worked <laughs> great because there you go. You know, you can't really talk when you're sucking on a lifesaver. <laughs> Good point. Good point. Thank you. All right, someone else, share with us an idea. What are some ideas you have? What would you do? What do you like? What have you seen done well? I think part of it um, that would make it really great is just to help the coaches understand that the, what they're doing currently, although some of it may be bad, that lots of it just needs improvement. Mm -hmm. uh, and so just kind of making sure that coaches understand that their goals, whether they realize it or not, whether it's like subconscious or they're like totally trying to, that their goals are the same thing that the PCA already is. Like they yep. want to win and they want to leave an impact, but some of them just may not know how to do that. And like I probably don't know how to do that. So I think it'd be great. As, like for us as the PCA to just really enforce that we're not trying to say oh everything you're doing is bad and um, like let's restart everything and start from scratch but it's saying okay here's where you are and here's the relationships you have with your kids already let's see how we can make those better and make your kids better and um, create a better atmosphere in general but just kind of building on what they have and shaping it to fit a better um, culture of youth sports. I love it. That's awesome. One of the questioning styles that I was going to share too that I love is just to ask coaches, what are you most proud of as a coach? And, and that gets a great discussion going. Or what do you do that's so much fun? You can bring that up kind of for emotional tank when we get to that. What do you do that's really fun? And I love that, Elizabeth. I think I agree 100% that a lot of the coaches that you're talking to are very positive coaches. And we're not trying to change the way they coach and make them these Superman coaches. We're trying to add to what they already do. So thank you for sharing that. Someone else. Kelly, it's Brian Swan. Yep. Um, you know, one of the things I do with some leadership development that I work with is I have a slide, and on the slide it says, how many are here? And the logical answer to the group is there's 12, there's 25, there's 30. Then I ask those coaches, how many players are on your team? And when we start doing the math, 
we understand that the volume of people who are really truly represented in the room is maybe two to three to four hundred. And so letting them know that the impact they have, um, the things that they learn, things away from PCA and implement, and the decisions they make are going to impact more than just themselves. And so there's a great responsibility in their role as a leader and a coach. That's a great way to do it. I like that. I like that a lot. I've seen a trainer too that asked um, how many they coach, how many kids that they coach, and they've actually added up, as you said, in the room and found, you know, you, you just these people in this room alone are impacting over 850 athletes every day. And that's, that just blows your mind sometimes when you think about that. All right, someone else. Tex from Minnesota. Yep, go ahead, Tex. So just a quick question. When they come into the, se the session, do they actually get their book right away? Yes. Most of the time, I should say, most of the time that's the ideal that they do. Every once in a while you'll have a partner that has not ordered books, but that's very rare. So one of the ideas that I had was possibly taking just, you know, some stickers of different colors mm -hmm. and put the sticker on the back of the book mm -hmm. and, so, um, and then have them handed out uh, in a specific order. And then I would say uh, when we started to get the interaction, because I really believe it's about community, that the uh, individuals would look on the back of their book and I would ask all the reds to get together, all the blues to get together, all the yellows get together. Because most of the time, coaches will sit with their, their fellow coaches and you want to separate them and get them to actually get beyond that comfort so they can actually start talking to people. Um, depending on the group size, and again, I'm thinking you know, we'll have a couple of different things. Um, there's another thing called circle, circle, where you have an inner circle facing outward and then another and then an outer circle uh, individuals will face towards that person and so you'll actually have a person in front of you but there'll be two circles and then during different times of the presentation for questions you can actually have them face each other and then the circles rotate so that you're always getting a different perspective and answering a different question with a different person I love it that's great I love both of those ideas I've, I've got something yes go ahead Barry Okay, I, I think I would take a wee bit different approach. In fact, I, I've actually done this. I would ask the coaches in the room to, to, to think back to their playing days and to start, try to think of a time where their, their focus was on striving to become as good as they're capable of becoming. In other words, it's not where they're at, it's about where they're going. Think about that. I'd give them a second to think about it, and then I would say, what was the coaching environment like? at that very time. And therefore, you'll hear them answer the question the way we'd want it answered. Because it's going to be positive. It's going mm -hmm. to be encouraging. Um, and pro probably it's going to have been indelible in their minds. And they won't have any problem. And then and the bigger picture of workshop, it, it enhances um, the interactiveness that we alluded to earlier. Today. I like that. Thank you very much. That's a great one. That's a great one. The last one um, that I would like to share with you, if you have a smaller workshop, this was one that I just learned this summer. Um, a, a, one of our trainers, Kelly Cagle, who lives out in Phoenix, does this with smaller groups. She has two pieces of paper. She uses those great big sticky note pages, and she put on one, skills and tactics, and she put on the other one, emotional support or emotional intelligence. And when she has them think about uh, this one, who is the most influential coach in your life and why, she has them discuss in a small group or in a partner about that coach and then she gives them sticky notes and she gives each person two or three sticky notes depending these little tiny sticky notes and she has them write an adjective to describe that coach on each sticky note so they might write um, supportive, caring, trusting, motivating, whatever and then she would have one group at a time come up and put their sticky note with the adjective on it on one page or another was this a coach, was this an adjective to describe how they taught you skills and tactics or was it emotional intelligence and emotional support? And by the end, the visual, she had us do it at um, the Trainer Institute out in California, and it was just so neat to see the visual of some of the most influential coaches we had in our life. Most of the sticky notes were on the page that was emotional intelligence. They were helping our emotional intelligence and emotional support. So I've actually done it with athletes, and I did it with high school coaches, when it was a group of about um, less than like 20 to 25. I did try to do it with a group of 75 I think I had a few weeks ago and it took a little bit longer than I wanted to but again it was it was very effective to do all right well it's getting close to the hour um, if you have any other questions I'm here I can stay on for about another five minutes or so 
before I have to start putting people to bed. But if you guys have any questions, um, I'm here. Let me know. Or ideas or anything like that you didn't get a chance to share. But I thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. And uh, your discussion questions are great. I'm really enjoying hearing the answers. And uh, you know, take the time to read them because it's, it's really great. And, and ask people questions. I saw some of you were asking questions back and forth and commenting for clarification. Because as I said, this, this pool of resources just in this course alone is amazing. So uh, definitely use it. So if you have any questions, I'm here. If not, guys, have a great night, and uh, I will catch up with you next week. Thank you, Kelly. Yep. Thanks, Kelly. Sure. Kelly, I have a question. Sure. When would we get an opportunity to go see a live clinic presented to help us sort of get a bigger grasp of the whole thing, these yeah. 90, 90 minutes? Is That's there a Great question. Yes, absolutely. I can give you a schedule of workshops that are in your area, and um, I can just let you know when they are. Just shoot me a line, and I will make. I can give you a printout of all the workshops in your local area. Tell me how far you're willing to travel, and I can. We have a um, computer program called EMS. I don't know what it stands for, but it's our computer software that um, organizes the workshops. So it great. has dates and times and who's presenting them. So yeah, that's a great idea. So just shoot me a line and say, hey, I'm I'm available next. Because usually they're on the weekends. Um, there's some on the week, but just say, hey, can you let me know within the next two weeks or even the month? I think I can do it probably for like a month out, right. and I'll let you know where they are. Absolutely great idea. Yeah, I've only seen one workshop, the one I actually attended about three years ago when as a youth football coach. So I've only seen one yeah. workshop done. Well, next I mean, week you know how I've done workshops with what I do, but, you know, this is different. Yes. Absolutely. Next week, I'm trying not to bombard you with too much stuff right off the bat, but next week, one of the resources I'm going to send you is a page of YouTube links where we have um, videotapes of, of trainers presenting workshops. So it's not quite like being at a live workshop, but it'll give you an idea. There's One of the links is a Double Goal Coach One workshop that Ruben Nieves, our lead trainer, has done from beginning to end. Another one are just clips from different sections that workshops have done. One of them's in there, one of the athlete workshops that I did for the NFL engagement um, player engagement program is on there. So I'll send that out to you next week so that you'll have that those clips. But let me know. I'd be happy to let you know where the workshops are in your area. Great. Yep. Hey, Kelly. Yep. I just thought I'd tell you. It's exciting. Um, I am coaching a youth. It's like elementary school soccer, but we have tryouts like next Monday. Um, but I was so excited because it's like I coach gymnastics, but my team was like, moving always. Yeah. Um, it wasn't like a set group of girls, you know, so I'm excited and I think my sister's playing because um, she's t 11. Oh. Um, and so I'm so excited and I thought I'd share. But yes, that's great. Well, congratulations on your Thank first you. coaching job. Thank you. Let and us the know how it goes. <laughs> yes, I will. I'll keep you updated. <laughs> Read the book because there's a lot of great resources in the book. For I know. Ideas. I've been talking to um, my soccer coach and then like the stuff in the book has been helpful too just because they're so young too. Um, it's just, it's, there's no, like, let's do the speed water and get really good footwork. It's, hey, let's work together and be a good team and work really hard and not give up, you know? Yeah, so, but exactly. That's great. Oh, that's so much fun. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. I will see you all later. Good night. Okay, good night. Hey, Kelly, which book are we using, the abridged edition or the original? The original, The Power of Double Goal Coaching. This okay, one right yeah. here. Yep, I, have, I have the other one that's, like, hundred well, much bigger that he originally okay. wrote. Okay, do you not? I can send you a copy of this. No, I have that. Oh, you I have, have that okay. too. Okay. Because somewhere it said first edition. I'm thinking, wait a minute. It doesn't yeah. say the power of. I have the original Thompson uh, Double Goal Coach. Okay. Book. Okay. Yeah, this is the one that we use now. Alrighty. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Hey, Kelly, this is Tex. Thanks again for uh, a great session tonight. Sure. Uh, Absolutely. Just, just kind of curious, and, and this is maybe uh, for a later time. Um, but uh, is there information on kind of the demographics of where coaching, I guess, is going as far as ages? Are, are, are I guess, the, the old school coaches, are they starting to retire? Um, or when we look at our sessions, is it pretty much just the same mix of young, middle-aged, and older? Uh, that's a good question. For, you know, are you talking specifically for Positive Coaching Alliance audiences? Yes. Yeah, I, I mean, statistically, I don't know. Just based on my own six years of experience, I think they run the gamut. Um, I think most, you know, it, it's kind of like it's been, most of the coaches are parents at the younger age. So, you know, depending on the age that you're talking about, I, I love it when I get parents in there that are, you know, I think, wow, you could be my kids because I don't feel like that old. But 
Um, yeah, you know, more and more often, which I think is interesting, I found a lot of like grandparents going back and coaching their grandkids, which I think is kind of a neat dynamic that I've seen, or coaches coaching at the youth level just because they've been coaching for 25 years and they don't even have kids involved anymore. Right. So um, I think it. I think it does. There is a variety. Most of them, I would say, are between you know in their 30s is pretty much our the average age of the audience members that we have, 30 to 45 somewhere in there. But you know that's the top of the curve. Okay, I was just kind of curious because you know at the University of Minnesota we're always doing comparisons of um, where our students are at by age and kind of you know the X generation and the millenniums and right. things. I think it'd be interesting to kind of look at coaches to see where they're at as far as their their middle age group because obviously their environment and their growing up play a big impact on on how they coach and parenting. yeah absolutely and it is interesting too because a lot of times in the workshops you'll say you know when you were kids and you were playing and you realize some of these coaches are only 25 years old so when right. they were play I mean it was it was a lot different than like when I was playing or when you were playing or when you know you really do that's that's a really that's a great um, comment to be aware of absolutely the other right. thing, Kelly, that I'd like to, to talk about or have you maybe provide some research is 